Next up, we have uh, Anna Goldenberg, who is a senior scientist in genetics and genome biology at SickKids Research Institute. She's also the Varma fam Family Chair in Biomedical Informatics and an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science. She'll be telling us about lessons learned in ML deployment in healthcare. Hi, um, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the lessons we learned when uh, developing and deploying machine learning in healthcare. So uh, this is not a news to you. This is a typical cycle of ML de development. Uh, we access the data, we implement our approach and the baseline, then uh, we figure out sort of the evaluation scenario, random splits, uh, cross-validation, etc. And then we uh, com compare our approach and the baselines, and then if our approach is also much better, uh, it goes into a publication. If not, we work on refining our approach, uh, and then we uh, hopefully ultimately publish. And what if I were to tell you that this, uh, this is just a small part of the deployment. Let's call this box A. So box A here can be the beginning of the deployment cycle, but uh, there's so much more to the deployment of machine learning in healthcare. And one of the important points where uh, we start or at some point we'll have to get to is what does the data look like when uh, it's in production, right? What is the point of uh, use uh, that where the, the method will be applied? And we need to capture the data at that point and put it in the, into the algorithm at that point um, to see how it will really work in practice. So sometimes it can be electronic health records, sometimes it can be streaming from a Philips device, maybe there is a special database that is set up, all of that has to be figured out for deployment. Um, then we have to set up an appropriate, uh, appropriate evaluation. Most of the talk will be focused on this box because evaluation is extremely important and there are many parameters about how you would evaluate it. And uh, ideally you, you want to set up your evaluation to mimic prospective deployment and see how it works in that regard. And then uh, the model that you developed and uh, potentially tested in the random split almost never works um, in, in, in a real setting, even off, offline. So we have to refine the model. We have to make sure that it works in the setting that are closer to deployment. And then there's a whole slew of things that may or may not depend on you and your team entirely, which is setting up the silent mode, which is potentially you'll have to involve IT in uh, uh, or uh, the clinical team in deploying it uh, where it will ultimately be used, but in ways that are not at all uh, affecting the, the current uh, workflow. So this is the what we refer to here in the silent mode. There are variations on what that silent mode looks like depending on the application. You have to conceptualize and implement a UI. Uh, if you're lucky, there is already a UI where you can just plug in your uh, predictions, but a lot of times um, in uh, potentially in places where uh, this is new, um, you have to worry about that too and uh, potentially work with people who are HCI specialists to deploy that. And of course, um, the, the first and the last is that all of the permissions and all of the teams have to be aligned with deployment, saying that, yes, this is okay, this is uh, okay to go. So the privacy teams, the IT teams, uh, all of that have to, be, have to agree, and that takes time uh, because normally this is not sort of their first priority. So the deployment is at the end of that, and there are many lessons to be learned on the path uh, uh, to get in there in each one of those boxes. Um, I will talk to you. Uh, so the problem with uh, the, uh, the fact that we sort of have different strategies for publications uh, versus deployment and that the deployment often comes after publications is um, 
how many papers uh, actually make it and how many tools actually make it uh, to practice. So the exponential uh, rise in the number of papers, and this is just a lower bound uh, because these are collated from PubMed uh, with uh, AI and ML in them, um, reach uh, over 25,000 uh, last year. But um, the deployed, uh, and this is the upper bound because we sort of looked for words deployed, and now there are many papers that say that deployment is important but don't necessarily deploy. So the percentage will be much, much smaller. This is less than 0.01%. So what this says is that the patients are not really benefiting uh, from all of this amazing and fantastic work that uh, a lot of us in AI and healthcare are doing. So. Um, some of the some of the lessons uh, that we have learned on the path to trying to get uh, the deployment to the deployment uh, finish line uh, are the purpose of this talk. So my first example, <clears throat> I will give two examples in this talk. My first example is um, the uh, planning of the staff and resource management in an emergency department at SeaKids, the pediatric hospital where I'm based. Um, here, the goal is to really help to, to have enough staff and to have enough uh, pro appropriate uh, um, care for the patients, uh, given how many patients there are. And the second example, uh, which is uh, quite different, is using the, the Fitbit watches to help with uh, COVID detection. So uh, the staff planning in the emergency department greatly depends on the patient volume. Essentially, this is the key contributor to making decisions. And here we have sort of multiple different escalation levels. So depending on the patient volume at the moment, uh, if it turns from 30 to 31, uh, we'll have to go to the uh, from normal to escalation level one. And at that point, we have to start discussing uh, because this is uh, up to 80% capacity uh, of the isolation beds. We have to start discussing maybe in a, a different clinic, a new space has to be opened. Um, at the escalation level two, there may be discussion about uh, um, opening that space and uh, starting to put isolation beds there. And this is already 100% capacity. So um, have to start planning for more staff and uh, potentially uh, faster discharge and uh, of the patients and onboarding of the patients. And escalation level three, this is beyond uh, the 100% capacity in the eMERGE. At this other clinic uh, is also at 100% capacity and start uh, talking to managers across the hospital to see if some of the patients can be admitted as inpatient. Uh, and um, so this is, this is very important to plan for and not act as, as it's happening. And of course, uh, our goal as machine learners is to um, uh, make a 24-hour forecast of the expected numbers and ranges of patients, uh, these ranges that I'm talking about within the escalation levels, to see if any escalation will be needed and when to be prepared for it. So this is the data uh, that uh, we had. This is all unique patient visits, about 202,000 to Sea Kids Emergency Department uh, for the last uh, two uh, June 2019, so three years. And um, this is uh, uh, the what you see is the patient volumes, and uh, you can see in pink is where uh, COVID has started, and what while well, you see a sort of uh, a, maybe a pattern uh, before when January you had uh, the we had the the high uh, patient volumes, and this has to do with the flu season and uh, a sort of uh, being right after the holidays, uh, with a peak being 140. Uh, patients uh, at uh, in January 2020, uh, you can see that during the COVID, the numbers went down significantly. And uh, they went significantly for, for many reasons. Uh, there were uh, lockdowns, uh, uh, patients, people started, uh, stopped going for reasons that they felt that they were not significant enough. There were different procedures for being admitted to the hospital, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So many reasons. But you can see that this, there is a uh, 
different phase. Uh, there's a sort of a phase transition here, and that uh, the the numbers and the patterns look completely different as COVID hit, and that they are slowly coming back up to sort of uh, the previous years uh, just now. So the model development cycle was interesting. Uh, this is a, a sort of a single variable predictor, uh, not so hard. So we started, of course, with the linear uh, autoregressive models. And the performance, of course, completely collapsed uh, during COVID uh, due to the non-stationarity. So then uh, we sort of uh, looked into using uh, Gaussian processes in a small training window and discovered that it was uh, the performance was unstable and not as strong as expected when you tested it in a truly perspective setting right we have to be predicting for the future uh, given the past and when uh, there's no overlap between the the past training and the future uh, uh, testing and uh, uh, validation, everything is uh, separate, uh, the GP performance did not do um, so greatly. And so the ultimate model that uh, we sort of uh, zeroed in on uh, is the XGBoost model, actually 24 XGBoost models for predicting each hour of the 24-hour forecasting window that we have to make the prediction. And then the smoothing using GP to generate the final 24-hour forecast. And that seemed to uh, perform much better with the standard uh, errors, of course, also available. So there are many questions that one has to ask when uh, generating this. Um, uh, first, how often to retrain the model, right? We are uh, training this model in uh, um, a specific uh, setting and in, the, in the, the windows and how often do we have to retrain it to keep it current, to keep it uh, highest quality. And as you can see here, you have to retrain it basically every day. Um, so if you are not, uh, if the model is not retrained every day, then the performance is uh, significantly lower. So the model, this model is retrained every day to make a prediction for the 24-hour forecast. How much data to train on? So, uh, of course, we always think in machine learning, the more data, the better. But it turns out that, uh, yes, it's true, but there is a certain cycle, as you can imagine, in a, a sort of patient volumes uh, within um, uh, a year. And uh, as you add more data, it basically adds more noise uh, for, for prior years. Uh, it adds more noise and uh, the performance may deteriorate. So this is not true in every case, but in our case, this was uh, true. Um, another important point is how many days to uh, validate on. So should we train up until the previous day, validate, and then uh, predict for the next day? Should, can we predict, uh, can we sort of stop training uh, seven days ago uh, and, and then predict uh, seven days um, uh, from then? And the reality is that uh, in our scenario, um, we have to stop one or two days before the actual prediction, the 24-hour forecasting window to achieve the best performance. And this has, again, to do with the intricacies of the emergency department, how it works, and the, the flows uh, and the patterns in the emergency uh, department. It would be different in different scenarios. So um, ultimately, uh, what uh, has to be understood is that the threshold has to be selected in a rolling fashion. So if you are targeting, say, 10% false positive rate, then maybe uh, in your models you want to set 5% uh, 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 false positive rate in any given model that you are selecting right now because we ultimately this threshold is a random variable and so you will be in one of these uh, gray curves you will not be on the, uh, the blue curve uh, every time you'll be in one of these gray curves and so um, we uh, uh, we have to be mindful of the fact that if we don't want to go below a certain threshold we have to be more conservative 
so ultimately, the final setup and performance is uh, to train uh, for one year, to validate for two days, and we retrain these models nightly. And uh, this, you, as you can see, we sort of set the precision threshold at 50%, but because we have been making uh, conservative selections, we actually have much better precision um, uh, performance. And what's interesting is that the beginning uh, looks uh, fairly um, you know, very uh, high variance. And the reason for this is that it has to do with lockdowns. And in Canada, as you may know, the lockdowns were quite uh, stringent and uh, lengthy and uh, frequent. And so at some points, we actually don't have any data. For That's where it's missing, and that's why some of the variance goes higher. So. Uh, I hope that example was clear. Uh, let me uh, introduce the second uh, second example. And this is a very different uh, setting. Um, in the literature, there have been examples of uh, wearables really helping with detecting that something is wrong with a, an individual, not a patient, but in a, a public healthcare space. And uh, what we wanted to do in collaboration with Evidation is to create a model that may predict uh, COVID from Fitbit. So the original goal was to take Fitbit, Fitbit derived features, and uh, say, okay, if uh, we predict COVID, great, uh, self isolate. If we don't predict COVID, uh, free to go. Right. So we had a substantial size uh, data set, uh, also courtesy of Evidation. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, 32,000, uh, over 32,000 Fitbit users and uh, uh, ones that are experiencing influenza-like uh, symptoms. So the original goal, the study started before COVID, and the original goal was to um, have uh, people reporting ILI and to see if we can predict ILI. Uh, which COVID is one of them. Uh, post uh, the beginning of uh, COVID, uh, we had 204 uh, individuals that reported testing positive for COVID in our data. So um, this, this, is, this is our data. The features for COVID that we had uh, were heart rate, steps, sleep, and we had 48 uh, derivatives of these that were also part of the models, and these are various quantiles of, uh, of these features, uh, max and min per day, et cetera. Um, uh, we also had the survey data that had demographics and the typical COVID screening questions, as well as ILI symptoms. So um, the first initial inspection of the data was quite exciting. Uh, you can see here the, um, all of the COVID cases aligned um, uh, uh, at, at, at the onset. And you can see that in the steps and the heart rate, uh, there's quite a bit of the average, and I will want to stress average, uh, signal that it starts even a little bit before the onset, saying that uh, potentially there is um, there is signal in steps and heart rate, less so in the wear time and, and sleep, uh, that may indicate ILI and COVID. But notice uh, that uh, the, the huge um, sort of standard deviation around it. And this is an important point because uh, However, uh, wh whatever we can do on average, ultimately we wanted to predict per patient, uh, per individual, and that is a very different story. So uh, this is uh, sort of the comparison of our data and uh, the prevalence and survey responses to the CDC reported data. So in orange, you can see the CDC. In uh, purple is the people responding to the surveys. And uh, in solid uh, color, you see, um, you see uh, the ILI incidents, again, uh, influenza-like illness, and uh, in uh, purple, you see um, uh, the survey, and in the um, dotted line, you see the COVID. And you can also see that CDC started uh, under-reporting uh, uh, 
ILI once COVID hit. And so this, this is sort of the gray line sort of indicates where COVID outpaced um, ILI. Yeah, at this point, which sort of uh, corresponds in both our data and uh, the CDC reported data. Um, also, we had a big spike, um, a bigger spike in the survey responses and uh, in COVID uh, activity than um, in the CDC reported activity. Uh, first news were not very exciting, uh, that Fitbit alone uh, did not predict COVID uh, very well. Here you see the AUC, and uh, we basically throughout uh, the study, uh, I'm talking about XGBoost or GRU uh, models, uh, which performed very similarly on this data. So uh, the... XG, uh, XG boost uh, here, uh, you can see that even though it goes above uh, sort of the 50% uh, random line at some point, it actually um, hovers just around there. So for public health, this would not be a very good tool. Um, so the initial approaches and randomly sort of setting up the train and test um, did not uh, uh, gave gave us a, sort of a sense of false hope. Um, so here you can see that we have about above seventy percent uh, AUC predicting ILI. So we switched from predicting COVID to predicting ILI. And uh, uh, here we have uh, AUC around the seventy percent. Notice that in yellow, this is a model that was proposed for predicting ILI from. Uh, wearables uh, in Lancet uh, just just before COVID hit, but for public health purposes. So this was not necessarily an uh, ML model. Uh, the yellow line corresponds to sort of thresholding, saying if your activity goes higher than this, uh, this this might be indic indicative. Or uh, sorry, if the activity drops below or goes higher, so if it deviates in in a certain way that you can uh, put a threshold on, then. It's, um, it's indicative of ILI. And when you report basically results on a full population, that's one thing, but when you're predicting for individual people, uh, it didn't perform so well. This model didn't perform so well in our study. But when we took the same model and we actually compared um, the uh, test uh, taken at random overall versus the solid line here, um, which is uh, weekly uh, performance. So it's the same model that was trained. It's still a random um, evaluation, but it's evaluation per week. So we sort of try to disentangle uh, the prevalence uh, from the prediction. You can see that the performance is much, much worse. So even uh, testing at uh, random versus testing on a per week uh, basis continuously uh, is, is better and is, is hidden by the fact that there is a lot of the jumps in the prevalence and uh, we are uh, sort of riding the wave of this, of this difference in, in the prevalence. Once you try to take that out of the equation, uh, the performance deteriorates quite significantly. And so um, sort of what we tried then to do is we tried to adjust, uh, to put in place the proper evaluation scheme where uh, we, uh, we um, sort of have the, the model trained and this is this is the same model still it's just to show a different uh, engagement so we started retraining the model prospectively but still evaluating it on the the uh, in red um, sort of the random test and uh, in blue the prospective uh, week so um, it's exactly the same model that is shown uh, in pink and in uh, blue but um the uh, the difference is how we tested it so it's in uh, pink you can see that the tested data was taken randomly from uh, the same period that the train that the, the algorithm was trained on and in blue it's the next week after the uh, uh, the the training uh, set finished so 
this is uh, one uh, figure. Uh, sorry, and uh, just to just to say that the um, the error bars are based on uh, bootstrap, and these are bootstrap intervals. And this is just to just to tell you that um, this is a very uh, very striking uh, difference about how we test versus uh, uh, the quality of the model. It's not really about the model. It's it's the fact that uh, the testing was improper before, and the random testing doesn't tell you how good the model will be when you um, uh, deploy it in a fashion uh, that uh, uh, when you test it in a fashion that it would uh, be deployed in the wild. So this is uh, something that we call continuous versioning. Um, this is um, uh, what we do now. So we basically train uh, for uh, week zero, we tune for week one, uh, then we, we test. It's called deploy here, but this is tested on week two and uh, in the, um, uh, and we keep retraining them every week. So we take uh, in this particular case, as much uh, training data as uh, we have, and we just keep tuning the new model and deploying it, which means there will be uh, some variance in the performance that we'll have to account for in our thresholds. Um, so another point, and one that came up in example, uh, in example uh, one, is that um, it's important to know how often to retrain. And in these models, if we are forecasting far in the future, um, this is uh, the darker models are the ones that were trained earlier, in November, December, and it gets lighter as we train. So um, uh, uh, if we are testing in June of 2020, it's really helpful if the model is uh, um, retrained in the last uh, sort of week. Uh, up to two weeks, uh, but um, further back uh, really uh, makes the performance much worse. So you can see that the models, especially this uh, yellow and orange models, they're performing better than um, than the models that were trained before, and they're performing better than what we expected in a COVID setting. And so what we did was we sort of redesigned and re-envisioned um, what the deployment uh, strategy might be. And in this particular case, what we propose is that we predict ILI. Um, and uh, if uh, our model uh, has a uh, predicts ILI, because we were capturing a lot of the cases that were not ILI, we were saying that they are ILI. So to distinguish among the, the true, the people with ILI and people with COVID, we propose to complete a short survey because the survey-based models perform fairly well. So we complete a short survey and then we predict uh, uh, COVID based on this short survey. So these are essentially in our case, two stack models. And uh, if we predict COVID, it's fairly certain that uh, the individual has COVID and then they should self-isolate immediately and take a test and wait for the results of the test. If we don't predict COVID, they might still have ILI and so they should not be exposed to others as a precaution um, uh, measure. And so we think that this sort of updated flow is a more useful flow for public uh, health. And we are discussing with Avidation about sort of uh, some versions of deployment. Uh, and Avidation is deploying some uh, part of this. So this is just to summarize the results of the Fitbit Plus survey. So here below you see a prediction of ILI uh, wearables. This is specificity. This is not AUC anymore. That's why you're seeing lower numbers. But you can see that when we do the ILI wearables and combining with a model uh, of the symptoms, we, we have a uh, much higher specificity at the rate of 70% sensitivity for this data. I'm not showing sure AUC because for predicting um, uh, with, a, with the symptoms, we actually have to pick a threshold for a particular model uh, for the, for the Fitbit results. So this is with a 70% sen targeting 70% sensitivity. Um, so to, to summarize, uh, the lessons that we learned through this process uh, are do not be fooled by good random performance. If this is how you set up the original evaluation, and I think we do it almost by default. 
um, is we sort of do this random uh, performance and random uh, evaluation and testing. It it really can have such a dramatic uh, difference from uh, perspective evaluation in the way that the model will be deployed that um, it's it's almost something you don't want to see, uh, right? Because then it's uh, very disappointing when the perspective performance is so much lower. So I would definitely recommend to evaluate the model in the way that it will be deployed right away. And honestly, it seems like such an obvious message. Um, but uh, paper after paper, especially in this Fitbit space, are being published with uh, various uh, different uh, um, evaluation strategies and uh, reporting very different performance. And maybe that for some other sort of deployment as, uh, other than broad uh, use, um, it would be okay. But it's really not um, uh, helpful in uh, sort of uh, to make the general uh, conclusion that Fitbit is predictive of uh, COVID uh, in our case. And I think for us as scientists, it's very important to the fact that um, to be to be sensitive to the fact that media really picks it up and and uh, may mistakenly. Um, uh, claim something that we didn't claim, but uh, to avoid that, uh, we have to set a very rigorous standards for our design of the evaluation of these models. Retraining validation and prediction horizon schedules really matter. So how much you do for your project, uh, it really depends. And sometimes clinicians want to set uh, sort of the timing themselves. They say, we need this prediction every eight hours, or we think every eight hours is good for the shift. But the reality is, is that it may not be good for their data, and they don't necessarily know that. So it makes sense to evaluate uh, what is the optimal timing and uh, maybe bring that back to the clinical practice uh, to confirm that um, uh, or redesign uh, sort of this this timing and scheduling priorities. Um, the deployment strategy may be rethought, and uh, sometimes you sort of start with one project and end up solving <laughs> a slightly different one. Uh, the example with a Fitbit uh, for COVID is one of many projects that we had in the lab where we started with sort of um, either public health or clinical projects, and the conditions uh, slightly changed in the process due to how the model was performing and maybe needed to engage more data or solving a slightly different question that is also actionable in the clinic. Um, you may use prox proxy labels, and sometimes uh, more frequently coll collected labels are needed, such as patient volumes, as opposed to escalation, or sometimes less frequently collected data, like survey responses, they really help. But uh, the point is that the actionability in each case may be affected, and they have to be, these decisions have to be made with, uh, with the whole team, with the clinicians and, and the experts and the end users. And uh, finally, it's impossible in 25 minutes to talk about all the lessons we've learned uh, from many projects. I'm just showing two of many, uh, and I'm happy to talk to people online. And with that, I would like to thank the audience, the organizers, uh, definitely my lab and collaborators, um, uh, uh, Brett, Eric, and Jared um, here on the slide uh, have contributed uh, the most to the projects that I've talked about. And uh, Devin Sin at Sick Kids is our go to master in the emergency department, as well as evidation and for you and me with a Fitbit uh, devices. Thank you very much. Uh, bye.